cute little dog you've got there. But hold on. In a previous life, he could have been George Washington. Nice cat. Perhaps Annie Oakley. And look at him. Why, it's Napoleon. Reincarnation. <laughs> Good morning, sweet world, and welcome to the No Dunks Podcast on the Athletic Network. It's Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. I'm J.E. Skeets here in the Classic Factory, and alongside me, as always, Tass Mellis. Playoffs lovers. It's not the postseason yet. Playoffs lovers, this one's for you. Next to him, it's the bearded one, the top shot hot boy, Trey Kirby. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. And last but not least, making the magic happen, super producer J.D. Hello. There he is. Here we are. I thought it was the postseason, not the playoffs. I never know. <laughs> now you got me uh, yeah. second guessing myself. Is it the postseason or the playoffs, or is the playoffs not the postseason? Who knows? We are here live on YouTube. Hit the like button and subscribe. Podcast listeners, five star rating and review. We got a lot to get to here today. We are going to preview and predict the three Western Conference playoff series that we do know. We also have a Giannis update. Blake Griffin has retired. But before all that, we got some play in games to talk about. And let's start with Zion Williamson exiting the game with like three minutes to go with leg soreness Mm. and the Lakers hold off the Pelicans to earn the number seven seed. We'll get to the Lakers Nuggets actual playoff matchup later, but this game was incredible because Zion was cooking. They came back. He had 40 points. He had 10 boards. It looked like they were maybe going to win this game. And then after a bucket, he comes down to us and is just signaling to the bench. I got to come out. And sort of goes off and throws a towel in frustration, and we never see him again. And we don't even know the severity of this injury. Leg soreness. I guess he's going to get some imaging today. Crazy. This was the best Zion game I can remember. This was the best Zion game of his career. And the first game of his postseason playoffs, whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah, right. This was That's what made it bigger. And he was just fantastic at the way he was driving every single possession. I was scared that there was going to be more mid-range shots because I watched him play the Lakers on Sunday. There was a lot of settling when LeBron was able to drop off of him. We're going to see some mid-ranges, even a three perhaps. There was one, and there was a mid-range shot, but he was just driving to every body. It didn't matter who it was. LeBron, Anthony Davis, Jackson Hayes, and he was going at them, 17 of 27 shooting. It was a great game. 40 points would have been higher if he didn't have to exit with three minutes left there because of something that he's got going on with the leg. And the Pelicans were able to fight. They were able to make it a tie game, minute 30 left. And I'm not going to talk about LeBron. I'm not going to talk about Anthony Davis because they won this game without them being great. D'Angelo Russell came through at the end of the game, minute 30 left. He got a steal. It looked like he was guarding Jose Alvarado, kind of jogging. It looked like D'Angelo was kind of chilling. Uh, But then he was able to steal one of his passes, and then at the other end, hit a big three in front of the Pelicans bench, do his little pointing, (laughs) and and the Lakers were able to win. Great game for them to be able to win without LeBron and without Anthony Davis having great games and clearly not having the best player on the floor. The Pelicans had the best player on the floor by far, and it would have been more fun to come down to the wire with Zion on the floor that's for sure it stinks that he left Uh, but their their support guys did fight at the end unfortunately Lakers just just did it at the end it was Russell was awesome I thought what did you think of this whole womp womp when Zion left the game after getting back into it I mean we were watching on playback so we were reacting to it live together with everybody joining us like oh my god no is this team cursed like he is having the best game of his career that postseason debut the 40 and 11 I should say and then he suddenly is just walking off, and everybody's like, what? Does he got to take a dump? Like, what's going on here? Because he wasn't, like, you know, grabbing anything. He just seemed to know, uh-oh, maybe the hamstring again? I got to come off, and we never saw him again. Yeah, he, he hustled off, too. He went off kind of <laughs> yeah. quickly, right? Uh, right? When he jogged back to uh, the locker room, I saw Will Guillory from The Athletics said he left the game without a limp, nothing on his leg. All we know is that it's leg soreness, but obviously... Zion has had leg problems throughout his career, including a hamstring, which could have just shown up. But weird to see him go off and not limp. And still, you know, 12 hours later, we got no idea what's happening. Must be serious because he was ready to come off as soon as it happened. It wasn't even a question for him. And just a bummer and uh, basically a microcosm of the way his career has gone so far. He's awesome when he's on the court. And then the availability can be lacking at some point. Tass is right. He was the best player on the court. He was going by LeBron and AD every time. This was one of the first times I've seen LeBron get hurt and almost feel like he got hurt when he tried to take a charge on Zion. I think he took two. But the one he took where he went flying, 
probably tried to embellish it a little <laughs> and embellished it a little too much because Zion actually hit him. LeBron two feet off the yeah. ground yeah. when he took the bump from Zion, but like Zion was everywhere. He was rebounding like crazy. 11 rebounds. He had five assists. I think he had nine points on four or four shooting in the fourth quarter. It was takeover mode. And you could tell that he was not going out the same way he did in the last regular season game. I'm not taking jumpers. He took a couple of them, but he was trying to get layups. He made a right-handed layup at one point. This was awesome to see from Zion. And who knows? If he's back for Friday, they got a chance. But other than that, uh, not great from the Pelicans yeah. because C.J. McCollum was brutal and Brandon Ingram was brutal to the point where they had to be benched in the fourth quarter. For sure. Brandon Ingram, second game back after being injured, did not look like himself at all. He just had to be yanked, as you said. Didn't hit a bucket in the second half. He just doesn't feel like himself. The C.J. McCollum one is even more of a question because Brandon Ingram came back from an injury. Okay, maybe he's not in the flow. C.J. McCollum literally was bad. Uh, didn't hit a shot in the second half until basically, call it garbage time, 30 seconds left where, right. where he scored there. It is unfortunate, very, very, very unfortunate that one of those guys, and you'd expect it to be C.J. McCollum. You'd think it would be C.J. McCollum to help out Zion because that 40 points and the 11 boards and the five assists and the two blocks. I don't know why the box score just gave him one block. It was a mistake. He blocked LeBron beautifully in the first half, and then he got one in the fourth quarter, six minutes left. What up with that? Uh, he played great defensively, too. He was giving it all, literally just throwing his body into guys. That one bucket where Jackson Hayes took the absorption of Zion Williamson. He was still able to hang and score, and he was doing it all. It, it sucked. They just needed one of their second. The former All-Star Brandon Ingram didn't have it, or, or C.J. McCollum, one of their second guys to, yeah. to step up. C.J. McCollum, you throw away Sunday's game where they lost again to the Lakers setting up this one. Didn't he have a stretch where he hit like 29 three-pointers over four games? Like He couldn't miss there for, what, a week of mm. basketball. But yeah, 1-9 and nine from deep, 4-15. He was very bad. I'll give, I'll give Willie Green some credit to have sort of the balls to be like, all right, B.I., you don't have it. We got to go with Trey Murphy. We got to go with Larry Nance. C.J., same thing. Jose Alvarado is just giving us more here than you are. Um, so, you know, he leaned into those guys. You know, he brought CJ back in after the Zion uh, injury with three minutes to go. But, uh, yeah, nobody really helping out Zion Williamson. They're star guys. Those other yeah. guys definitely played a part. I mean, when Trey awesome. Murphy hit yeah. that, uh, I mean, he hit a couple huge moon threes, shot. but that moon shot <laughs> down the stretch, and then suddenly we had a game. But, yeah, when Zion goes out, we had LeBron hitting a jumper. We had AD dunking home uh, an Austin Reeves alley-oop lob. We had Russell hitting that three that you already talked about, Tass. He hit, you know, five three-pointers in this game. And then we had AD grabbing that pretty crucial offensive rebound where he's underneath the, the rim and he sort of grabs it one hand and then there's a foul called in the play and he uh, knocked down um, at least... Uh, did he hit both those free throws? I believe he did to help the Lakers hold on. But Isn't man, that the one where uh, Reggie was talking about missing the second one? Well, no, that oh, was right at the, the end. That was at the very end. That was I guess, insanity. Yeah. <laughs> that was Reggie. I don't know what was happening there. Where, right at the end, they have a chance to make it a four-point lead. AD hits the first. Now it's a three-point lead. Right. Uh, the Pelicans don't have a timeout. It's uh, on that end of the floor. I mean, there's 2.7 seconds I think remaining. Not like 0.5 seconds remaining. Where yeah. okay, yeah, sure, you can miss it and just tip it up in the air. It's over. And Reggie's talking about, well, oh, should they miss this? Everybody's like, what are you? <laughs> like, what? No. <laughs> Reggie's a broadcaster now. He wants exciting games. Mm -hmm. You got to give the other chance, to, the other team a chance to tie it up here. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you can. But uh, yeah, that the rebound by AD, that was a, a highlight rebound. Yeah, Larry Nance did a great job. He's usually not the greatest rebounder, but he had 12 last night, 10 of them defensive. But AD made the play to come from basically the other block, grab it one handed, get fouled, and go to the line shooting free throws. I agree. Willie Green did a great job sitting down the stars who should have hopefully been carrying. The only thing I would say was a mistake was pulling Jose Alvarado for Dyson Daniels on the three pointer that D'Angelo Russell hit. Because like where what is Daniels doing helping off the strong side corner? He should have just hung out there. You know, you can give up a two and still play for a tie on the other end. Giving up a three is the worst possible thing. That's a good call. Totally a good call. He has done that you know, late in the regular season where he sat CJ McCollum and said, we just need four shooters basically around Zion Williamson that we can rely on right now. And looking forward to next season, maybe that's what they got to do. Jonas Valanciunas started in this game and they tried going to him early. But obviously, defensively, he's just a little too slow. Zion in the four shooters, which was Larry Nance, essentially, was awesome. I know Zion can't play center. That is a little bonkers. I thought that at the beginning of his career. Maybe, maybe, but it's not going to work. Zion and four shooters is going to be the answer. And I do want to say about Reggie, give him a little credit here. Maybe, 
maybe he just wasn't looking at the scoreboard. Maybe he thought that Anthony Davis was going to line up one. So maybe just hit one and then, you know, move on. Or, or, or that would be two. even Give him a sillier. Chance to or, or, no, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that would be even sillier. There's no way. It there makes was any no sense. way. I think he just had a brain fart. Honestly, like it makes no sense. You hit the free throw. <laughs> no, to let's put say you up four. Yeah, you don't well, have the time out. The time, the time doesn't work either. But let's say there's ha- half a second left. Okay, but that's a whole, totally new scenario. Yeah. Let's say they're up two and he misses a free throw just so they can't get a good three off. <laughs> maybe the only thing I know, is it's an if excuse he thought for there Rich. was the only thing is if you thought there was 0.7 seconds yeah. left then yeah. maybe it's a discussion <laughs> even then you should still just hit it maybe because the clocks, then it's over yes. <laughs> maybe the clocks were bad in the smoothie king center oh, maybe know. they're <laughs> smoothie in the clock system uh, so it stopped working. I don't know. D'Angelo Russell, uh, when he hits five three pointers or more, the Lakers are 17 and one, and uh, you know this guy was ridiculed for how he played last year in the postseason it wasn't good we're gonna see if he can play better against the nuggets uh this round but he's been incredible this year for this team and the shooting that he brings them and when he's playing sort of d'angelo russell like a little loose and chirping at the crowd he was doing that right from his first three um you know they play with that spirit a little bit so big game with with ad limited with the back spasms or whatever's ailing him and yeah lebron two of 11 in the second half uh zion was doing an awesome job on him when he was out there um they, they still pull this out. It's pretty miraculous. They're two stars. Bad games. Yeah, 6 for 20 for LeBron. I didn't feel like he really made his imprint in the game, though he was awesome in transition, which they kept mentioning. That seemed to be the easiest baskets LeBron was getting. He did have nine assists and nine rebounds. Yeah. Went to the line 10 times, made them all. So he True. did the little things, yep. I thought, but he just wasn't uh, efficient scoring. He was playing in a crowd a whole bunch. I thought Davis was kind of the same. They both missed so many layups that you see these guys usually uh, knock down. But Russell was good enough in the first half, I thought, to carry the Lakers while LeBron and AD were trying to gain their footing. Yeah, he was the guy that set up all the guys off the bench to start that second quarter. The Pelicans look like they had this thing to some degree. They're up double digits. So the Lakers pulled out. Uh, they had Spencer Dinwiddie on the floor, Torian Prince, uh, and uh, Jackson Hayes out there. And LeBron was just pff, 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 passing them out to the three, passing all, everything out to the three point line. And those guys turned it around. And in the second half, Got, let's give Darvin Ham a little bit of credit. He said, you know what? Gabe Vincent, you're playing pretty well. Spencer Dinwiddie, you sit. He mm-hmm. didn't play the second half at all. And Gabe Vincent was awesome. Nine points in this game. I know that sounds a little nuts. Nine points, that's, that's not a lot. Well, he returned from injury with six games to go in the regular season, or his last re- six regular season games. He only scored seven points combined in all those games yeah. and hit one three in all those games. So he outscored all those games. Uh, he was big. <laughs> this is why they signed him. Uh, for moments like this in the playoffs. So the Pelicans will get another chance here. We'll find out whether Zion is playing. They'll host the the Kings, and we'll get to that game uh, on Friday night. And obviously the Lakers move through to take on the Nuggets. Any other notes from our playback watch of Lakers-Pelicans? Either random notes or things from the game or things to watch moving forward. What do you got? The only thing I'm really thinking about right now is how many costumes there were in the stands for New Orleans. Like, I can't believe how many different style bird hats they have. Mm-hmm. I saw a pelican. I saw several chickens. Yep. Uh, there's probably a duck in there as well. There was a person dressed as a crawfish. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, we kept seeing that one guy who had like Kim Mulkey frilly arms <laughs> with a top hat on. It was wild stuff in New Orleans. So cool for them mm-hmm. that they get another game here. Uh, unfortunately, the pelicans are worse at home than they are on the road. Isn't yeah. that right? Yes. Maybe they want to go and play in Sacramento for wow. this game. Wow. Mm-hmm. You think they could call up Adam Silver and say, we <laughs> we'll would like to, to pitch this idea. Yeah, yeah. we will come Got to you. cancel our houses. It's still a little messed up from the first game. We haven't had a chance to pick up. We'll be at your place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring wine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have anything else from this game? Uh, well, the performance by Pel. Pell, what was his name? Just Pell? Only Pell? Pell, yeah, or something. Yeah, it? Pell, the Pell. Yeah, it was fun just to have in break and play. It was the mid of the first quarter or maybe the end of the first yeah, quarter like where he was performing in the audience. And he is a musician. He's a rapper. And he's just doing his thing in he the audience. He literally just performed fun. a song in the stands. It was sort of catchy. Uh, yeah, you can look sure. him up. Now, sure. people weren't seeing this, obviously, on the TNT yeah. broadcast. We had some in arena feed that we were watching. And yeah. Just put on a show there. Think he'll be there on Friday night? Think they asked him back? <laughs> no, they lost. Yeah, that's true. Uh, all right, let's move over to Sacramento. Oh, man. Kings eliminated the Warriors, 118-94. They're still alive. They are the the uh, you know the ninth seed here. They will now go and play 
the Pelicans, like I said, but the Warriors lose this. This is the blowout uh, from last night in the end. So a year after losing Game 7 on their home court, one where Steph Curry went for 50 to, to knock them out. The Kings got a little bit of payback there against the Warriors with that victory and, and maybe, possibly, signaled the end of a dynasty. We can get into that if you want, but your takeaways from, from the Kings, 118-94 over the Warriors. Well, I just love their supporting cast in this game. I thought it was awesome. The fact that mainly Keon Ellis and Keegan Murray were acting like they've been in the postseason before. No problem. Keegan Murray, this is his second time, obviously, after after last year and losing. And he uh, was horrible against the Warriors in last right. year's playoffs. Anyway, as a rook. Yeah. Yeah, so it makes some sense. He was ready. Eight threes, 32 points uh, for, for Keegan Murray. He was so good. And his first job was guarding Steph. Uh, and then Keon Ellis took over in the second half. And I thought Steph was frustrated with how much these guys were all over them. Keon Ellis, we've talked about him here on the show multiple times. And you think... For, for everybody who doesn't know him, oh, this guy's young. He can't he can't do this. He, he obviously is ready to do this. Second year player, and he's 24 years old. So you know, an older young player that poked from Steph in the first quarter and then got another pick early in the second. I mean, those guys were just awesome, and they didn't like, like we talked about LeBron and Anthony Davis didn't have to be awesome. Fox and Sabonis didn't have to be spectacular in this game because of those two guys. So that was. Phenomenal to me. That's what stood out. And, and they rely on those guys, too. They didn't go to the bench like the Pelicans had to and play a lot of minutes. Only 32 minutes you know, in real time for the Kings bench. Key stuff uh, by Keon Ellis and Keegan Murray. Nice. That was nice. Key. Double keys. Double, Double keys. keys. Yeah, keys Dude. open doors. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, this is incredible, uh, honestly, from the Kings. They completely dominated the Warriors, I think. Everybody in the starting lineup finished plus 20 or better, and it completely felt like that. Their starters were outplaying the Warriors starters to the point where you're like, that doesn't feel like they're ever coming back. And the Kings were able to hold the Warriors off the whole time. They gave up 22 in the first quarter. They gave eight, gave up 18 in the fourth quarter. They had a second quarter or a third quarter where they scored 37 points. They were just the better team for the entire night because like Tass is saying, yeah, Fox was pretty good. Sabonis was pretty good, but they were really carried by their three other starters in uh, Ellis, Murray, and Harrison Barnes, I thought was pretty solid yeah. in this one as well. Obviously, Clay Thompson had a really poor game, finishing 0 for 10, no points, didn't even get a free throw or an open layup or anything like that. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis wasn't really able to stay on the court. They went with Looney more often because he had a good matchup against Sabonis uh, last season. But this is great for the Kings to go into a game where people are picking against them. Uh, psychologically, it would be easy to be down having lost Kevin Herter, having lost Malik Monk, and knowing Steph went for 50 points on your home court to eliminate you last year. And it didn't phase them at all. That yeah. was super impressive uh, by the Kings, I thought. Yeah, I think it really, they really helped out by Keegan Murray hitting, what, four three-pointers there in the first quarter to give him a little breathing room there. And then he kept it going. You said eight. That's a play-in record. Eight three-pointers made. <laughs> we keep track of them. He had nine boards as well. The Keon Ellis, yeah, this guy like, you know, from a two-way guy, a guy that was in and out of the rotation for Mike Brown. Now he got an opportunity because of these injuries to some of their guards, to some of their wings. He's taking advantage of it. He made life hell for Steph. I mean, smart move, like starting Keegan on him, more size there. And as the game went on, you could put this super fast guy on him. I thought the officials were letting these two teams play, too, so you could be a little more physical, sort of off the ball when they're trying to get Steph coming around picks and all that. And, uh, yeah, to have... Steph Curry only go for 22 points, not even a ton of shots. And then for Ellis to chip in 15 points, five assists, three steals, three blocks. I mean, if you're doing like the stars of the game, it's probably, it's it's one, two between Keegan and Ellis. And then your, your all-stars, your all-NBA guys, probably Fox gets the third one. And Sabonis was right there as well. Fox was really good in the third quarter. I thought that maybe, it got overlooked because of these sort of role players stepping up. I thought he did he did great in that quarter where they started to separate. He had 14, I think, of his 24. Mm. That's like picking his spots. I thought he played a really just smart game, yeah. uh, sort of under control. He did. But it was it was good. The Warriors committed 16 turnovers. They gave up 15 offensive rebounds. Way too many threes. Open looks. They looked slow. They looked old. Yeah. <laughs> they looked you know especially when Clay is going 0 for 10. Draymond was not all that impactful. You know, a couple nice defensive plays which you expect from, but. Not a huge impact on the game. It felt like, it really felt at times like, Steph, save us. Yeah. Steph, please, anything. And they had these guys just running multiple guys at him. 
Yeah, and Steph stepped out of the ba- out of bounds in the fourth quarter. So did Draymond. Yeah. And it's just like, whoa, these guys. This isn't this isn't the best Warriors that we've seen here over the last decade. But thinking as the playoffs came on. Th- I thought, well, we have seen the best Warriors at least the last few weeks. Yeah, so this true. was surprising to see, as you mentioned, those offensive rebounding numbers for the Sacramento Kings. That's where, that's where they got popped in Game 7 last year. The Warriors felt good. And here it was the Kings. 15 offensive boards is a monstrous number. And they just continued to do it quarter after quarter after quarter. It's, you'd think the Warriors would come back. Yeah, you right? kept waiting. You're yeah. like, yeah, when's when's the, sh- the ball going to drop here? But this was revenge. This yeah. literally yeah. was revenge for that entire arena, for that entire fan base. And we're going to see if they can do it again Friday because they really just shut everybody up. They shut me up. I just didn't expect it, especially the last few weeks. They gave up big leads in losses. They gave up two 20-point leads and another 17-point lead. So you thought, how the heck are they going to do this for four quarters? But I think the, the Keon Ellis thing is real. The Keegan Murray thing is real. Like They have guys that you can just plug and play right now. It felt like one of the weird things in coming down to America, to the South especially, was like learning about uh, college football, right? Because it was just something I never followed in Canada. And I, I bring this up because my good friend Jared, you guys know, he went to Georgia Tech. So I started going to the odd football game. Georgia Tech stinks at football. I mean, yeah. they haven't been good for a long time. Mm-hmm. And he started explaining, though, that a good season to Georgia Tech would just be beating Georgia. And I'm like, hold on. So you're saying your team could go 0 and 12. But if you beat Georgia that season, that's a success. 100%. Absolutely. And I'm like, you're kidding, right? No, that's how they think here with these rivals between, you know, especially like the the, the, the underdogs to the big dogs, the actual dogs uh, <laughs> in Georgia. And that's what this sort of felt like for the Kings. Now they got another game to play. They got, you know, they want to get into the playoffs again and try and win a series. I get all that. But it was like, this is their, they're the little brother against the big brother. And this was a, a hell of a victory that they can be like, at least we got this in this very weird season where it was a little bit of a disappointment uh, from last year. They got it. They got the one to take out their NorCal neighbors there. What are they, 100 miles apart? And they kicked their ass, too, is the other thing. It wasn't, oh, they got lucky on a bounce here or there. It was, it was domination, like you said, Trey. Sort of all four quarters, they showed they were the better team. And that was a uh, long-winded way to say <laughs> all of that, but I wanted to bring up Georgia Tech football. <laughs> Shout out to Calvin Johnson. Yeah, that's right. That's Georgia right. Tech students are too smart to be good at football. That's, right. that's yeah. the problem. That's exactly right. Engineers aren't good at football, I, I guess. <laughs> they should engineer a good offense, shouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> they ran the Wildcat for a bit. I know that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you need the personnel to run that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> any other notes uh, on the Kings specifically, because we can talk about the Warriors and whether this is... The end of the dynasty? Do you think this is the last we saw maybe Clay Thompson with Golden State or at least this iteration of this incredible team from the last decade? It's very, very tough to say what Dunleavy is thinking in that front office, but I think this is the end of the dynasty. I think we've seen one of the best teams in the history of the NBA. Yes, no doubt. And Steph is definitely coming back. The question is the other guys. I know Chris Paul is done as a Golden State Warrior. I just... He just have to be. He just has to be. He yeah. was nowhere to be found last night. I mean, he, he's a backup point guard, and they're spending yeah. $30 million. Exactly. It doesn't so, make sense. So no. number re- reason one, for sure. The other questions are Draymond Green or Clay Thompson. And Draymond Green has caused a lot of problems these last two seasons. It's been a dramatic two seasons. And I just don't know if you can try and do it again. It's not like we won the, uh, uh, we won the title last season – Give us another one. They've had two chances now, and it hasn't happened. So Draymond Green, I think, it would be tough, but they'd have to find somebody who'd want his contract. So mm-hmm. that's a tough part. The Clay Thompson one, that's more like, hey, this guy is still loved by our franchise, but do we just give up on him? And I think it might be good for Clay Thompson just to go somewhere else. Orlando is a hot rumor where he would go and just be a guy that would be asked to shoot every single possession. So that might just be better for Clay Thompson if he wants that kind of thing. That's whether he wants that, yeah. Yeah, like Tony Parker leaving the Sac- or the San Antonio Spurs for <laughs> Charlotte. You know, I want to try something new, try something different. So it's kind of up to Clay, really, whether or not there's going to be a dynasty. For me, Draymond Green is – that's the front office saying, okay, we got to do this. Okay, we got to give up. I mean, it's, it's, it's those two guys, really, that what it comes down to for me. That's tough. It's a tough call. 
Yeah, that's tough because Draymond's actually signed. Uh, he's got two years left on his deal plus the uh, plus the option year that matches up with Steph Curry. But Draymond is also the reason they've been in the position they have been the past couple of seasons. He punched Jordan Poole in the face. That ruined last season. But then they said, it's all good. Jordan Poole's gone. He was the problem. Draymond missed 30 games basically this year due to suspensions. They played at a 50-win pace when he was on the court. Yeah. They're still good when Draymond plays. They wouldn't have been in the play-in where they're losing one game and they're out of the playoffs if Draymond was able to stay on the court. So, yeah, I mean, I guess if Golden State could find somebody that's interested in taking on Draymond this late in his career with this much money, maybe they would entertain that. But I think that's unlikely. It's going to come down to Clay to me. And it's going to be his decision, I think, because I think the Warriors would take him back for the right deal. But... Clay's a pretty proud guy. Uh, mm-hmm. We've seen how often he talks about having four rings. Is he going to want to take a 50% pay cut to stay with the only team he's ever played for? Maybe. Mm. Because I think that's the only way he stays around. Because I'm with you, Tess. they got to move on from, from Chris Paul. That's just too much salary to spend on a backup point guard when you've got a guy in Pajemski who can handle that sort of role. they got to figure out what to do with Wiggins. The guy is signed through 2027. Cool. That last option is a player year, and he has been completely unreliable on the court and being on the court since they won the championship. Peyton, Gary Payton the second, remember that guy? We haven't oh, talked yeah. about him the entire season. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. Looney has taken a step back. And honestly, Steph Curry is one of the 10 best players in the league probably still. He's not one of the five best players. So I kind of think that the Warriors need to get a second star. So they should be doing whatever they can, packaging Chris Paul, Wiggins, the picks that they have, any of these young guys who are still interesting. Like, Kaminga's a great player. I think he's probably been the second-best warrior the whole season. They should trade him because, what's? I mean, if you're trying to win with Steph Curry, waiting on Kaminga to be your second-best player, it ain't going to work. So I think they should probably be in the Carl Anthony Towns market when it comes down to it. Yeah, I mean, this is a team, too, with a historic luxury tax bill yeah and they ended up the 10th seed and they're out after one game so yeah these these it sounds like these spending cuts or whatever are coming chris paul can you find somebody that's even interested in andrew wiggins draymond's a fascinating one and then clay thompson yeah i mean i don't know my gut says he just it's interesting you're right he's a very prideful guy i mean this stunk this was weird to see like oh for 10 we always talk about clay thompson in the, in the big moments and big games he generally comes through or is he still a threat but I mean, this is now two years in a row where he's like, whoa, whoa, in, in like the big moment where he just had a stinker. Um, I don't know. My gut says he still stays, though. And I hope he I guess I hope he does, too. You know, I don't yeah. want a Tony Parker on the Hornet situation. <laughs> it's sort of sometimes nice to see these dynasty teams not like, yeah, still get another chance, but just at least even stick together. Yeah. Um, but he would have to be at the right cost because you can't go giving this guy, you know, $30 million or something like that per year. Not even close. I mean, you should get We got Grayson Allen making what? 20 million per a little bit less mm-hmm. um it probably should be around that yeah i just think the orlando magic would suit him so well he wouldn't have to be a great defensive player because you got great defensive players around you so many of them so you just have to be solid defensively and you can shoot every time because we need a guard who yeah, can shoot no, every no, time it makes so sense. That, that would make sense but i do get not wanting him to stay there that's for sure I compared it to the Spurs situation, but they had two guys who ended their careers, who started their careers there, and Duncan and Ginobili. So we know Curry's going to finish his career there. We know. Is the second one going to be Clay? Um, I think it, there's a bigger chance that it's Clay than Draymond. But they got to find somebody who wants Draymond. That's going. That's hard to do. Uh, the, the other thing is, it's going to be hard to find somebody who wants Chris Paul's $30 million if they opt into that. Maybe if Chris Paul is very nice, he'll say, I'll take a cheaper contract and you can trade me somewhere. And that would help out. They're going to f- be hard. Could Chris Paul be done? He could retire. He could. Yeah. yeah. First time he's not made the playoffs this season. That's right. right? That's right. At least and, and his money's not guaranteed for next yeah, season. Yeah. No, if it's they not. trade him, they could a team can yeah. cut him. Yeah. Um, it's very unlikely he'll be with the Warriors. No. Yeah, for sure. But Kuminga and Moody, those guys become extension eligible this offseason. There's that as well. Like, big decisions, of course. And you're saying you still have Steph Curry. Still, despite his age, is obviously an elite player. You want to find that that second star because it's it's not Draymond or Clay anymore is the truth. He wore down this season, too. He Curry did. was he did. an MVP candidate through the first half I of agree. the season. And then he had to carry this team to the 10th seed, and he mm-hmm. got tired. Yeah. Yep. Um, who do you think the Thunder would rather face in the first round here now that we know it's Pelicans-Kings on Friday night? Uh, I guess there's the whole Zion par- portion of this. Is, is, is <laughs> yeah. that the easy answer? They'd rather see a, a, a Zion-less Pelicans team <laughs> than uh, well, the Kings? Uh, I think they'd just rather see the Pelicans, period. I know the Pelicans have beaten them five friggin' times uh, this season. Pelicans have beaten the Kings, yes. Yes. So that would be obviously tough 
That being said, it would be hard for Zion to do what he just did again, even if he is playing. I mean, that's that was an incredible game from Zion. The second thing is, who is their second best player? Who would help out Zion? Brandon Ingram just doesn't look like himself. He just doesn't. Uh, CJ McCollum, maybe, perhaps. I just think the Kings are a better team right now. All five of those guys in their starting lineup right now are better. I mean, there's there's no starter who's scared, you know, from Fox, Sabonis, the Keys, and Keegan Murray, and Keon Clark, uh, plus Harrison Barnes. And they, they barely went to their bench. I think I think they just think they, they're a better team right now. Thunder would prefer the Pels to yeah, the Kings? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's... Um, I don't really think the Thunder should be shaken in their boots, regardless mm-hmm. of who they're going to play. Shea has lit up both of these teams, and I think that they would have an advantage. Uh, that's why they're the one seed, playing against whoever this is going to be the eight seed. But with the question marks of Zion's injury, how Brandon Ingram has looked since his return, I think that the Pelicans are the easy choice for OKC. Uh, we have a little news when we're looking at injuries here. According to Woj, the Milwaukee Bucks are preparing to be without Giannis for the start of their Eastern Conference first round series against the Pacers. They're hopeful, though, that treatment on his left calf strain will allow him to return sometime later in the series. We're going to do our Eastern Conference playoff previews on tomorrow's show, but just to slip this news in here, um, no Giannis over the weekend, at least for that game one. So is that going to change maybe uh, where you're leaning in a Bucks pacer series? I, I wasn't I wasn't pro Bucks in the way they've been playing recently, okay. <laughs> no matter what. Does Dame kind of go back to his Portland days and feel pretty good about you know not having to go through Giannis? If it's just one game, you just got to have a monster, monster Dame game. So he could feel extremely comfortable with that, where he's just literally the guy as he was last season seasons before but if Giannis is out the entire you know whether it's two three four games I mean that's that's terrible for for the Bucks in general I think it's a little surprising that we already know Giannis is going to miss yeah. game one this Sunday. Is the guy, Sunday yeah, game. yeah exactly yeah. Sunday game and then I think they play their second game on Tuesday, Tuesday. which is pretty quick turnaround yeah. so it wouldn't be surprising if Giannis misses both these games I wonder how much Dame can throw it back to the Portland days because his last five games here in April 23 a game but he shot 39% from the field and 28 from three he has not been the same guy this season though we have seen him have like 40 point games and hit a game winner Dame time mode when Giannis has been resting mm-hmm. that was earlier in the season he's a little bit banged up right now so they're going to need some major performances from Dame Lillard and the resistance isn't always going to be there <laughs> from the Pacers, if we're being honest. But uh, that is the key to me. And then secondarily, like, what is Chris Middleton actually able to do right now? He has averaged 16 points per game, 50% shooting in 12 games during March and April. 16 points per game ain't nothing. Mm-hmm. That ain't going to cut it uh, in the postseason for a Bucks team missing their leading scorer, especially with the question marks of Dame. So we know the Pacers are going to score. I'm a little concerned that the Bucks are going to be able to keep up. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like Milwaukee's just decided, we're just going to try and get him another week of rest here. Because you're right, a little fascinating, even from a gamesmanship type of move to just say, no, he's out. <laughs> I mean, you're telling the Pacers yeah. that. Now you're telling your team that, like, hey, we got to do it without him. I get that. But uh, yeah, they're, I think they're just thinking, we got to split. We got to split in Milwaukee before we go to game three. Basically, you know, we're looking at a week uh, after the start of the series, almost, and maybe that's enough time to get Giannis back there. If he if he does return, I mean, it could be a much more severe than they're even leading on. And they're going to rely a lot on Bobby Portis, I think. I know, I yeah. know, it sounds a little crazy, but he's going to be the guy starting for Giannis Antetokounmpo. And when Giannis was hurt this season, he put up monster numbers going into that last game where he had 30 with Giannis sitting down. He was. 23 and 11 in in those six games that Yanis had missed going into the final game that Yanis had missed and I thought well those those aren't real numbers <laughs> uh, but Bobby was Bobby and he dropped 30 and he looked awesome and so Bobby is going to be the guy that they look to in the mid post what Bobby does um, and yeah Chris Middleton as a third guy it, we, yeah, we just have to think about how many games this is for Yanis but yeah. uh, Trey brings up a good point it doesn't feel like it's one game <laughs> feels like it's more, way more than that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that might depend on how those first couple games go. I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. do you do you panic if you're down two uh, to Indiana, or do you even wave the white flag if you're down two and say, "Well, it's not our season. This was a a shit show." Who knows? We'll see. We'll get to the Eastern Conference uh, playoff previews tomorrow because we're doing the Western Conference playoff previews right now. Let's start with the Clippers Mavericks. Round three between these two teams. Uh, They haven't met in the postseason since 2021. L.A. ousted Dallas 4-3 in the first round that year. 
and has ushered out the Mavericks in the last two postseasons they've met. None of that sounds right to people, though. <laughs> it feels like they played much more recently and that Lucas Mavs won one of those times. But no, the Clippers have beat them uh, two times, so this is the third go here. Game one tips on Sunday in Los Angeles. One thing to watch in this 4-5 matchup. What do you got circled? Well, as you said, this is a different Mavericks team. This team plays defense, surprisingly. Surprisingly, I, I didn't know it was coming after the Gaffer trade, the P.J. Washington trade. They have looked good since March 10th. They've got the league's top defense so over a month, and they rank first in rim protection. And the Clippers want to get in that lane. That's where they want to crash. And I'm looking at a, a couple of the guys. I'm, I'm looking at – I'm keeping it simple. Maybe it's just because I watch play-in games and I just want performances from stars, but I'm – looking at Kawhi if he's going to be back and be able to do that it is strange I, I think you, as you said people don't know that the it was years ago that the Mavericks played the, the Clippers people don't know that Kawhi has been out for a while and yep. hasn't played uh, in April he, he played the first 62 of 68 games 62 of the first 68 games I should say and then he hasn't played in April he had uh, treatment for soreness related to his surgically repaired right knee and the Sad part is, or the worrisome part is, I should say, Teron Lue was optimistic he'd come back in those, you know, first couple, first week or something. You know, like he'd yeah. come back, but he's literally been out. So the Mavs defense is real, and with Kawhi Leonard, it looks even more real. I mean, I think I think that is what I'm looking at. It to see if the Mavs can just slow down the Clippers. And Kawhi's, it looks like it. Kawhi's status for Game One already up in the air, yep. and and it's sort of a here we go again. And Tass said he hasn't played since March 31st. And this knee is causing him issues here. So I don't think the Clippers can beat the Mavericks without Kawhi. I'm not even sure they could beat the Mavericks with Kawhi, the way Dallas has played over the last little bit, and especially since the trade deadline, adding some defense there. But what are you watching besides Kawhi's health, I guess? I mean, Kawhi is the big question because he's the only guy on the Clippers that can really outplay Luka throughout the course of a series and make it tough for him. Uh, I guess if I'm a Clippers fan, I'm a little encouraged that he's already in for Team USA. (laughs) (laughs) Plan on being healthy over the summer. Maybe that means he's healthy right now, but we've also seen Kawhi dominate the first two games of a series and then be out for the rest of the playoffs. So huge, yep. huge question mark and not knowing what you're getting from Kawhi. The question for the, me then becomes, can James Harden actually score points? Can <laughs> he can he look like the James Harden that he was when the Clippers were going 26 and 5 in December? He's been playing through shoulder injuries, foot injuries. Uh, since the All-Star break, Harden's only been averaging 15 points per game on 39% shooting, 30% from three. And like you said, the Mavericks have been a pretty good defense. They're 13th in the league since the All-Star break, and they've been even better in the last couple of weeks heading up to the playoffs here. Not to mention, Harden is probably going to have the best matchups for scoring because you assume that, like, Derek Jones Jr. and P.J. Washington are going to guard the wings for the Clippers, whether that be uh, Kawhi or Paul Paul George, George. depending on who it is. Kyrie probably is on Terrence Mann, which means Luka is getting some of the Harden assignment. Mm -hmm. They're similar-sized players, and Luka has definitely given a better defensive effort this year, but there's got to be times when Harden is looking to get to the hoop, draw some fouls, rather than just being a pass boy. If all the stars (laughs) actually play in this series, it's wild. you got Luka, Kyrie, Kawhi, Harden, Paul George, and Westbrook. Apparently they've combined for 47 All-Star nods, two MVPs, two NBA Finals MVPs, and six scoring titles. That's just all Hmm. of the guys, but those are the superstars. Is there an X factor in this task from either side? that you're looking at i gotta go back to james harden as as trey just said will the pass boy be the score boy that's the (laughs) important part here because he came to this team and was very excited to come to this team to be the third score really and now if Kawhi's out he's got to be a different guy he's got to be what he was in philadelphia last year second to joel and he's got to be second to paul george at the at the at the worst um and he was good in last year's playoffs I, i know it didn't end well at all, but he won games. He really did win games for the Philadelphia Sixers. He was the reason. They got up 3-2 against the Celtics, uh, but then it fizzled. And, uh, you know, Trey went through the numbers. It has been it has been bad. Uh, the last dozen games, it's even worse. If you look at it this way, 36% from the floor, 26% from three, under four three free throws attempted per game, and that's where Harden used to make his money, and it doesn't look good. And Luca, I think, will... Be a pretty decent defender. We we always used definitely to say, seen some yeah. more commitment to that end of yeah. the floor from him and Kyrie. They're, I mean, it's just this team effort. They've buy, bought in a little bit more. Yeah, and you going through the matchups. That was a good call because if 
Luca's guarding Harden. It sure feels that way. It feels like Luca can stay in front of Harden. Why not? Uh, he can be that that strong guy that everybody used to say. Oh, Harden's a really good post defender. I mean, Luca's very very strong, and Harden ain't as quick as he used to no. be. And they're officiating the game a little differently. Yeah, that's true. So it should be a good matchup. Uh, all right. Well, let's get to the prediction then. TK, get us started here. Where are you leaning in this one? I think it's hard to pick the Clippers not knowing what you're getting from Kawhi, uh, especially considering the Mavericks look like a real team. They've been, I don't know, the best team in the Western Conference for I, the last 30 games here with the yeah. way Denver has, you yeah. know, not – they didn't finish the season strong, I don't think. We actually saw some, like, clutch mishaps uh, from Denver, and Dallas has – Looks really, really good. The question for me is going to be what do they get out of their wings? I think Josh Green is going to have to have a good series, and Dante Axum is going to have to have a good series, not to mention P.J. Washington, Derek Jones Jr. Like, yeah, they got to get something from that foursome uh, of wings out there, and they got to hope for hot shooting uh, from Tim Hardaway Jr. as well. But I don't know. I think this is the time that the Mavs are getting through. So give me uh, the Dallas Mavericks in seven games. Okay, yeah. go in the distance. Mm-hmm. Dallas winning in LA to win that game seven says trade just to, to speak to your point yeah the Mavs went 16 and two there down the stretch and then they sort of coasted they rested those last couple of games once mm-hmm. they were locked in so lost a few at the end but uh, really good probably were the best team at least in the Western Conference or the last good stretch here you uh, also taking the Mavericks I am mm, yeah I, I think there's gonna be a lot of Mavericks picks in this yeah. series it's it's not fair without Kawhi it'd be <laughs> it would be way more interesting I know it, it should still be a fun very fun series but if Kawhi isn't playing, Paul George is going to have to be awesome. He's really going to have to be extremely good offensively as the go-to guy. And as you mentioned, uh, the Mavericks have you know a bunch of guards and, and wings. And Dante Exum will, will probably get a, a, a lot of minutes out there, even against James Harden. He was really good when he was a member of the Utah Jazz guarding James Harden on the Houston Rockets. He was physical. He was really good. So that's going to happen throughout this series. Uh, they're, they're getting Derek Lively back. It sure feels like as as the, the alternate to to Daniel Gafford. He hasn't you know played for a couple weeks now, so they look like they got everybody back. Mm-hmm. They're healthy uh, and they're playing really really well. I got the Mavericks in six. Uh, ooh, yeah, I'm taking the Mavericks in six. Feels weird saying that because I, I thought the Clippers would have their mon- have the the number here uh, of the Mavericks, but. It ain't, it ain't the same without Kawhi if he's not playing. Another uh, stat to illustrate the Mavericks' turnaround here. This is from Schumann. If you take away the last two games, again, they rested Luka. They rested Kyrie. The Mavs were 8.4 points per 100 possessions better after the trade deadline, after those big moves, than they were before it. That was the league's biggest improvement by a wide margin, pre-trade deadline, post-trade deadline. So that's just been an incredible move, bringing those guys in and Washington and Gafford and helping the defense and then letting Luka and Kyrie just cook and they take over at times. They're awesome. And uh, you went Mavs in seven. You went Mavs in six. I'm going Mavs in five because this Kawhi, man, too many times. I mean, he's already coming in uncertain. You said last year, Trey, looked awesome for a couple games. Then he's out for the rest of the season. 2020, 2021, you know, he's just out completely. Even the Raptors championship, the guy was playing with a bum leg the entire time uh, for a good chunk of that. So don't like their chances. This is, I think Dallas is finally going to get their like little revenge here and finally win one of these series. I know we're saying Kawhi's not playing, but he is supposed to be coming back. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the reports are it is soreness in that knee uh, that's surgically repaired. And our man Law Murray of The Athletic, who's covered this team for a while, said that did happen in that year. I think it was 2021. Um early in the year and he was able to come back after 25 days which is you know a little shorter than what we're at right now uh, so he should be back I guess uh, but it is it, it feels like that time of year where Kawhi gets hurt right it is <laughs> late in the year and he did play again 62 of the first 68 games maybe he should have rested <laughs> damn it <laughs> in, in the one. end a lot of injuries in the second half of the season I'll say for yeah. guys playing through the first half yeah alright let's move to Wolves Suns Phoenix Suns dominated their three game season series with Minnesota each loss uh, for Minnesota just got worse and worse it felt like but that was then this is now <laughs> they're 0-0 here on Saturday when they meet again and uh, yeah we got the Wolves as the number three seed six seeded Suns Game one of that first round series. Can't wait for this one. Um, are the Suns the Timberwolves kryptonite? <laughs> That's what we're going to find out here. What are you watching in this one, TK? This is a bad matchup 
for the Timberwolves. Like, the worst possible matchup. So, for me, this series 100% comes down to Carl Anthony Towns. I think he is the biggest mm. question mark in this series. He's coming back from a meniscus injury. He's played a couple of games. Looked super rusty. And who is he going to guard? Like, that is a huge question for me because when you're looking at the matchups, Conley's going to be on Beal. McDaniels and Anthony Edwards are going to take turns on Booker and KD. Gobert's going to be on Nurkic. So what's happening with Carl Anthony Towns? Is he guarding Grayson Allen? Because that's going to be a lot of wide open catch and shoot threes for Grayson Allen. Or is it going to be switching it up and Towns takes Nurkic and Gobert is the roaming guy? He might be looking at some more catch and shoot threes uh, for Grayson Allen. I just think that's a tough position for Carl Anthony Towns. I wonder how Chris Finch is going to scheme this because it just doesn't make sense to have Towns chasing a small ball four or whatever you want to call Grayson Allen or whoever the fourth guy is out there um, for the Suns. I think there are going to be times when the Timberwolves look their best with Towns playing at the five and Gobert resting. That'll probably be the case with Nas Reed. But when that's the scenario, then it's going to have to be Carl Anthony Towns punishing a small ball team, making good decisions when he gets doubled in the post and getting back to all-star status rather than the guy who's turning the ball over all the time. So a ton of pressure, I think, on Carl Anthony Towns <laughs> in this. And if you're asking this guy to just make good decision after good decision and not get offensive fouls, that's a huge ask. Yeah, it's a great call on the Timberwolves' defensive plan overall. Like, this is a great defense. We know that. But this is also a great Suns team in terms of just shooting the ball. They are so good at shooting mid-range shots. They're really good. They shoot the second most in the NBA. The Timberwolves allow the fourth most in the NBA. So how are you going to stop? Yeah, not only their big three of Beal, Booker, and Durant, but what's going to happen with Grayson Allen, who is the best three-point shooter in the NBA. I know I'm I'm extending the range a little bit, but he's had the best percentage to the season. So Mm -hmm. the fact is they have crushed them all those three games, as as you said there, Skeets, for this reason, uh, because the Suns are just able to find open shots and they step up on the defensive end. There's there's no doubt. We've said the Anthony Edwards numbers, and I'm sure we'll say him again, but they step up on, on the guards that I think their guards are just uh, a match, a great match for them. Um, I, I know it's Anthony Edwards and Mike Conley uh, up against Booker and Beal, but Beal gives it. Beal, he gives it on the defensive end. Uh, he has been really, really good, and overall, offensively, has been awesome recently. 36 in the final game against uh, the Timberwolves, six from six from three, the last 12 games, shooting 60% from three-point land. The guy is averaging a steal and a block in the, the last uh, dozen games or so. So it just doesn't look good. Like the Suns scored 44 points in the first quarter against Timberwolves on Sunday. I know it's the regular season, but the matchups are just not good. Uh, that's just the way it feels. The Wolves have been outscored by Phoenix by 25, 26, and 17 points when Gobert was on the floor in those three games. Those are three of his four worst plus-minus games this season. So it's it's a difficult matchup for him because of the shooting that Phoenix can throw out there, because of their funky, weird lineup and how they play. Also, the Suns are hot right now. I mean, it's go- sort of been overlooked a little bit, talking about the Mavs, obviously those teams at the top of the West. And maybe it was a disappointing season overall for the Suns. You know, we took the over on their over-under win total. But they went 10-4 and four down the stretch. They beat the Wolves. They beat the Nugs. They beat the Cavs. They beat the Clips. They beat the Pelicans. They beat the Kings. They beat some really good teams. Remember we were talking about their schedule at the end of the year? We're like, oh man, they might be in trouble. They handled that really well. Big part of it was Beal starting to look like old Bradley Beal and it's just like unbelievable that this Wolf season, as great as it was, they've fallen to have this 3-6 matchup where they get this team that seems to have their number. Um, I'm with you so much, Trey, on and I don't like it from the Wolf side of things that Carl Anthony Towns is the ultimate X-factor in this because they have decided Phoenix we just get the ball out of Anthony Edwards hands and we are not convinced anybody else can beat us on your team and you know Cat obviously coming back from the injury and has just looked rusty him and I think to some extent oddly like Conley they just have to be huge in this series because they have got a guy an ant an all NBA player possibly 26 points per game this guy He's averaged 14 against the Suns in three games, and they just they just get the ball out of his hands. They double team him relentlessly, force him to make a play, and then oh, we think we're worried about Gobert or McDaniel's or you know no, so it's got to be Cat I think to sort of save save the Wolves here. But anyone else on the X Factor list for you, Taz? 
It is Cat. Uh, that's who I had listed. Is he too good to be an X Factor? I don't know. Um, just because our All Stars allowed to be X Factors. I mean, he wasn't. Oh no, you should you should be good if you're an All Star. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's really the the offense is a big question. The defense is a huge question. But the offense, as you said, he just came back from injury. The first two games that he played, he had ten and eleven. That's it. That's it. Just ten in one game and eleven in the other game. And so when they get the ball out of Edwards' hands. Rudy Gobert is not going to punish uh, the Phoenix Suns. Conley, it's unlikely. I mean, we saw good games from Jaden McDaniels this year where he had 28, and there were those moments, but it is going to be Cat uh, on that end because I-, I think that is an advantage for the Suns when it's Beal, Booker versus Edwards and-, and Conley. They've just done a great job, and they've forced those guys to turn it over a ton over and over and over again. They had 19 turnovers in the first half the last time they played, seven turnovers in the first quarter the time they played before that. So, Catman, you got to be awesome. You have to be, like, really, really good with his offense players because I know this Timberwolves team looked like they were going to be the number one team in the West, but they've had a very mediocre offensive season. They're a, they're a middle-of-the-pack offensive team, bad in fourth quarters. So are the Phoenix Suns, actually. Uh, so <laughs> yes. that's, that's strange. It's going to be fun watching fourth quarter games. It might just be a defense fight. Be a wild card. Yeah. Uh, and, and Carl Anthony Towns, we've seen before, that guy can get flustered, frustrated with what, the whistle that he doesn't think he's getting or you know a little contact here and there. This quote from Conley jumped out at me. He said, we have an emotional team. We have a lot of guys who can get lost in the game, get lost in the referees, get lost with confidence or something like that in and out of the game. Um, they were fighting each other yeah. on the sidelines last year. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's true. <laughs> Punching walls and pushing each other. Yeah, not good. But like honestly, if Cat gets a head. charging foul in the first five minutes of this series, I would not be shocked. And if it, if that happens, I will switch my pick because I'm ultimately going to go with the Timberwolves. Okay, here. let's I get to believe. predictions. All right. Yeah, You're going Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. All right. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know why. I don't feel confident about this um, at all. So I feel like I'm self-swerving here. But if the Timberwolves can keep it close, they can win in the fourth quarter because the Suns are just as bad as Minnesota is. Uh, in clutch offense, Phoenix is 23rd. Minnesota is 22nd. That's bottom 10. It gets worse because in full fourth quarters, Phoenix is 30th. Minnesota, though, a whopping 16th. Oh, that's hmm. almost top half. Hmm. Almost, almost. But it's going to come down to can Jaden McDaniel score? He scored 25 points against the Timberwolves total this season. Six in one game, Suns. six in one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, 13 in another. They need him to have some confidence shooting the ball because they need his defense out there against all the scorers that um, – Phoenix has. I'm looking forward to Anthony Edwards and Devin Booker trash talking each other. These guys are two of the biggest trash talkers yeah. in the league, and they're like playing for the same spot. Best shooting guard in the league. I would say Booker's probably like a step ahead because of what he's accomplished, but I think Anthony Edwards is trending up, and maybe he puts them over the top here. It's going to have to be a massive Ant series, which is weird because this is one of the teams that plays him the best and does everything they can to make sure somebody else beats them. So I'm going with my guy, Cat. <laughs> Timberwolves in seven. Towns Ooh. averages 30 a game for this series. <laughs> Man, this guy's coming back from a meniscus tear. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's going to be on a tear. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Okay, that's a good swerve. I, again, yeah. it feels like a series sort of similar to the Clippers-Mavs, where a lot of team are, a lot of people are taking the, uh, the lower seed just because of the matchups here and the way those teams are playing right now. Mm. Wolves, Suns, what's your prediction? Yeah, I'm, I'm taking the Suns. I've just believed in them in the three games that I've watched. And I know that the Suns had a, an abysmal moment. I think that's what you know, made you say, Trey, I'm not taking the Suns in the, in the playoffs. That's right. They lost yeah, by 30. Um, so that was horrendous. So it is going to come down to which team can do it in the clutch. Because they, I guess they're going to be close games. That's the weird thing of this regular season series. If you want to factor that in, the Wolves have never been within single digits in the second half of any of those games. It just doesn't feel like that's going to happen in the postseason. It feels like it should be closer. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. should be. Ant's not going to average 14 points per game in this series. He might have some stinkers, but yeah. he's going to have some probably huge games and probably get right. some victories. Yeah. yeah, but they do double him and, and get yeah. the ball out of his hands, so other guys are going to have to do it, and it could be Cat, that's for sure. I don't know if it's going to be Jaden McDaniels. who There are moments, uh, but... I'm not sure about that. I don't know if it's going to be Conley, so I don't know if they have it. I don't know if they have the the offensive key here. Uh, yeah, maybe Nas Reed plays a ton, uh, but I'm taking the Suns. Uh, Suns in, I was going to say the, just the number of six or seven. That's why I was saying s- but I can't decide. 
I'll go seven. I'll just go seven. But that that would be a win in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it should be a close series. Uh, very close with you. I'm going to go Suns in six. But uh, definitely an entertaining series. I'm most excited about this one because these teams, <laughs> they both the way they're built, uh, have plans to go further than winning one playoff series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I know it's a maybe you could say a little early for Minnesota, but not really with the amount of money spent on their big three there. All right, let's move to the final series in the Western Conference. We got a rematch of the 2023 Western Conference Finals. Yes, as I'm sure you've <laughs> Who's heard, your Daddy. As I'm sure you've heard, the Nuggets have won eight straight games against the Lakers here, entering Game One on Saturday. I mean, Jokic, Jamal Murray, <laughs> he's uh, absolutely cooked the Lakers in a lot of these games. So one thing to watch in this two-seven Nuggets Lakers matchup. TK, what do you got? I think the Lakers have to win Game One. Okay. Okay. Could you argue, argue they have a better rhythm than the Nuggets right now? Sure. They've won two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> a whopping two in a row. And, uh, you know, we saw Denver lose the biggest game of their season against San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It feels like for L.A. to have a chance here, they got to win one of the first two in Denver. Because if they go down 0-2, then they got to win four of five against this Nuggets team. That seems very unlikely to me. I will say... The Nuggets didn't end the season perfectly. Uh, you know, they had they won their huge game against the Timberwolves, then let it down against um, Spurs. against the Spurs there. But there have been other times where they actually didn't come up clutch, which was surprising to see because through the first 70 games of the season, they were the best clutch team out there. So a couple of little falters. I don't think their bench is necessarily as good as it was last season, at least a little bit more unproven a little bit more up and down so i'm just looking at that game one because that's the best chance i think for the lakers to get a win in this series and to maybe flip the script here and put the nuggets on the back burner or at least put them on their heels but if uh, if it's a blowout in game one for denver i would think this is a sweep whoa okay okay oh uh, yeah it's a great call i, I do think that the game one obligation here is totally true and that's why throwing the play in for the lakers is a dumb idea uh, because (laughs) they they want to if there's any chance of beating the nuggets it is this time where the nuggets haven't got into an incredible flow here going into game one um Jamal Murray is sort of hampered a yeah, little that's bit. The thing. That's yeah. the thing that yeah. Michael Malone said about Jamal Murray. We got to get him back. We got to get him back. And he did play five games to end the season, but he said, we got to get in a good mm-hmm. flow before the end of the season. It's, it's good for, also for the bench uh, to see a great Jamal Murray. And he was awesome against this Lakers team well, last year. I mean, he was, it was stupid good. And they did get up 2-0. And then in the th- third game, Jokic started a little slow, but Jamal Murray just said, I got this. 30 points in the first half. Um, that was an incredible game. The 50-40-90, I think we don't talk about. He had 52% from the field, 40% from three, 95% um, from the free throw line, 32 points. That's only been done 11 times in NBA history. You average 30 points and go 54-90 in a series. That's pretty freaking awesome. Um, so, I don't know. I'm going to be watching Gabe. My man, Gabe mm-hmm. Vincent. Boy, Gabe Mellis. Yeah, he's coming off the Lakers bench, and he's not going to start by any means. But they got him to play against Jamal Murray a little bit. I mean, he has heat culture in him. He saw him in the finals. He couldn't stop him. Uh, but uh, but they need somebody. Uh, they need somebody to slow down Murray. And yes, the fact that he hasn't been amazing again. Only five games to end this season. He has been. He was good in those games, but he didn't have a a game where he was required to be awesome. He didn't play thirty minutes in any of those games. He played less. So yeah, it's a rhythm thing. And and you're right, Trey. I mean, the Lakers are in a flow. And they just had a bad LeBron and AD game. So maybe they're better in, in game one. Yeah, they have to steal game one. The one thing to watch is if uh, the Lakers can just outplay the Nuggets in clutch time this time. Because didn't we have the most competitive sweep ever in last year's Western Conference Finals? You know, say, they something. were all close games. They were all always in the game, the Lakers. But it was just down the stretch when it's the two-man game of Jokic and Murray that no one's figured out how to stop. That's when they would always just like eke it out, get the victory. I mean, they were close games, so can the Lakers play better in the clutch and, and obviously hit the big shots, and can D'Angelo Russell continue, you know, firing away and hitting some of these threes? I went over the record, 17-1 and one when he's, like, sort of on fire. I mean, five is a lot of three-pointers made for a guy like him, but they're just almost, they're almost unbeatable when he's hitting the three and he's feeling good, so... Can we get these competitive games again, and can they can they finally figure out the Nuggets down the stretch? Do you have an X factor in the series? 
uh, Lisa Al Gabe and D'Angelo <laughs> Russell is 100% the X factor. D'Angelo Russell averaged six points, two yeah. rebounds, and three and a half assists against the Lakers or against the Nuggets last season, and eventually got benched yeah. for Rui Hachimura. It was actually Austin Reeves who was their best perimeter player, but I kind of agree that Gabe Vincent is going to have to play a big role in this series because he's a better defender than Russell is. But on the flip side, Russell's shooting has been huge for the Lakers as they've made their charge uh, after the trade deadline into the postseason here. I also think throwing Gabe Vincent into the mix, the Lakers bench has to outplay Denver's bench just because I think that the lights are a little brighter here. Christian Brown has had some great moments this season, as has Peyton Watson, but they're definitely more unproven than they were last year. Reggie Jackson, we know he's a Ferris wheel as well. So the best chance the Lakers have is like hot shooting from Russell. He doesn't get completely killed on the defensive end. Maybe Jamal Murray is looking slow out there and his shin splints come back uh, to beat him. And maybe Gabe can hit some threes and do a little uh, against uh, Jamal Murray, though. In the, the finals, Murray went for 21 points and 10 assists a game. So yeah, I don't necessarily Gabe, know. Gabe did not the, play well. Either. No, he's yeah. not. He's not really a stopper, but it would be helpful uh, because their perimeter defense it just ain't it. Um, and you need that against a Nuggets team who has the perfect two man game. It's scary because you also need big man defense, and Anthony Davis doesn't look healthy. Uh, he Anthony Davis did play obviously against the Pelicans, and he played well, but he was hobbling a little bit. I mean, and now. He has to be the guy who guards Jokic. They decided in, in last year's series, you know what? We'll throw Rui on him at times just to have Anthony Davis be able to be that help defender and to save his body. Mm. And I thought that that boded well for Anthony Davis through 82 games. Okay, they're going to keep him healthy, but he hasn't been all that healthy. He is a little hobbled. Now you got to guard Jokic. So that's a big ask uh, for, for Anthony Davis. I... They don't have a backup guy to guard Jokic. I mean, they can throw Jackson, Jackson Hayes. Jackson Hayes is the answer. They can. They can <laughs> throw him out there. Uh, they did you know, in that in that Pelican game. They threw him out there because they had enough shooting around him. And so, the, yeah, the guards are going to be important. They just have to hit shots, and Torian Prince has to be awesome. But as Jamal Murray said, me and Jokic are the best duo in the game, and they're freaking good. <laughs> and they're so good. So Anthony Davis is going to have to be awesome, and he physically he hasn't looked that great. Um, even though he's played through it. He has he has played through it and he rebounded and all that, but now you gotta be that against Jokic. Predictions. Let's hear it. Who are you going? I think the Lakers are okay. I think they're a little <laughs> bit better this season, and I think I the agree. Nuggets are a smidge worse. Just a smidge. No Bruce, no Jeff. So I'm giving the Lakers one game here. Nuggets in five. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Still a competitive series? The, the, the most competitive five-game series we'll ever see. No, margin of victory more <laughs> okay. for Denver this season. Okay, so we get some blowouts here. All right, Nuggets in five. Where are you leaning? Yeah, it was uh, four games, 24 points total uh, last season wow. in the conference final. I, I do think we're going to get some blows, but I do think the Lakers do get a dub uh, because, yeah, the, the Nuggets just aren't cooking, cooking uh, right now. They face them in the conference finals when Jokic hit a game-winning shot against Anthony Davis. That was a freaking tough shot. Like, they were absolutely sizzling at that point. And they're not sizzling right now. So, one or two, yeah. I think it's just, I'll give them two. I'm going to give them two. You're going two. It, it feels different, feels wrong, because I, I do think Denver should is still the favorite to win the whole thing. But, yeah, I'm giving, giving them two Lakers. So, you think, the, you think the Nuggets maybe do drop maybe game one or one of the first two games, probably, to get there? Yeah, you yeah. Have, it has to be on the road. I, I don't, they're not going to lose two games in Los Angeles. No way. I'm 100% with you, Tess. I think Nuggets in six, so I'm going Nuggets. Uh, but I'm, I think, you know, the, the, D'Angelo Russell is really, truly the ultimate X-Fire. You went over it. You said, like, he's stunk last year. They couldn't even play the guy. And he's, like, been one of the best players for the Lakers over the last couple of months. Now, it's, it's very similar to banking on, like, well, Carl Anthony Towns has got to be good. That's very similar yes. to a guy like D'Angelo Russell. But uh, I think he'll come through for a game. I think D'Angelo Russell is going to really help them win one game. Then you've still got LeBron and AD. That probably is one more, and that's it. Um, hopefully they're competitive games like last year. But I'll go Nuggets in six. You got Nuggets in six. We got Nuggets in five. Let's hear from everybody out there. Three Western Conference series. Call your predictions. I know you're doing it in the stream team now. And let's see who can get all of these right. Before we go, Tweet of the Night. Mm, tweet of the Night. Wow. Twitter. Big news on Twitter yesterday. Mm -hmm. Came to us from Blake Griffin himself. Mm. Fiend. That's it. That's the whole tweet. Yep. 
along with this gigantic letter he wrote that starts, I never envisioned myself as the guy who would have a letter to basketball retirement announcement. I'm still not going to be that guy. Then he goes on to write four paragraphs, <laughs> letter to basketball, signs it, thank you, Blake Griffin. Wait, am I that guy? <laughs> Perfect from yeah. Blake Griffin. Yep. He's officially retired after playing for four teams, 13 seasons in the NBA, a six-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA. He obviously was the rookie of the year. Yep. After missing his uh, original rookie season, Blake Griffin, man, an outpouring of love for Blake Griffin on Twitter yesterday. And great to see go around because Blake Griffin has some of the craziest highlights yeah. you will ever see from early in his career uh, with the Clippers. He made Mozgov into a verb. <laughs> That's right. He made us learn the word thrunk, though I think Dwight Howard gets a yeah. little credit as yeah. well. But uh, Blake certainly popularized it. I know we did, a, or you did, Tassa. Is Blake Griffin a Hall of Famer? Short? I agree with you. I think he will make it there. The way things are going in the Hall of Fame, yeah, I think that helps out uh, Blake Griffin because obviously not a lot of playoff success. But a guy you know um, and a lot of success overall. And I, the fact that he announced it on Twitter was fitting for me selfishly because – He's in my hall because of Twitter, really. I uh, mean, yeah, he, you said peak Twitter was he basically was, Blake Griffin. Yeah. He was the king of Twitter. <laughs> in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, yeah. when he was giving it to Mozgov, giving it to Perkins, giving it to Pau Gasol. IG highlights wasn't really a thing yet. <laughs> YouTube highlights wasn't really a thing yet. TikTok didn't exist. Well, Everybody was watching the experience of Blake Griffin on Twitter. People grabbing clips and just putting it on Twitter. And so it was a secondary experience, but it was just me selfishly. That's where fun was for me. Call me a dweebus. I think uh, Blake, <laughs> Blake Griffin likes to call himself a geek too. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was my fun. I mean, he would, he would be, he would also produce lots of great clips, obviously dunking on everybody and just showing how high he can jump even the the eric gordon and blake griffin one two combo was freaking good but also he would like throw water on a fan by accident you remember that like oh, yeah. right in front of right oh, in front yeah, of the score great. table he just pretended to drop water but he was just doing it to a guy like it was just fun overall and yeah the stats you know maybe maybe you can make it a, a good case that he shouldn't be in the hall whatever um yeah, selfishly, he was just he was one, he was the best dunker of five years for sure before Zach Levine came around. It was more it's more than five years, and yeah, he's just he's known he's known. He has one of the funniest tweets of all time, I would argue, when he had uh, the yeah. "Don't agree with the furniture layout, but I'm not an interior designer." When he <laughs> we got the photo of the chair propped up against the door in the big free agency drama there and that fun storyline. So, yeah, peak Twitter is a good way to put it, and. Average 19, 8, and 4 over his career. You know, you know, what, ballpark 800 games, but pretty cool. He's still the last player to be selected for an All Star game as a rookie. Now, yes, he had the whole year where he sat out, sort of, it's a, a red shirt uh, type of thing here, but that's pretty wild. And before that, it was Yao. So it's just like very rare for a rookie to make the All Star game. Um, and he also won the slam dunk contest by jumping over a Kia car. That's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> In that yeah. same weekend that he was there. <laughs> Number two scorer in Clippers history. 10,000 plus points. Do you know what number one in Clippers history when it comes to total points? It's a weird one. Elton Brand? No. Ooh, no, it's a good guess. Good guess. So it's an Murray? old guy. Bob McAdoo. No, it's not Not that old. It's a weird name guy <laughs> that you just forget. Uh, Let's go make yeah, sure I have this right. Uh, yeah. Eric Gordon probably wasn't there long enough. No. Baron Davis? No. Not no. A, not a Vinny Del Negro. That's not a chance. Who? Who Ooh, could it be in the 90s? What, what era are we talking about? We're here? talking... Uh, Not Darius Mons. We are no. talking 70s and 80s, but mainly 70s. So oh. we're talking Buffalo... Uh, franchise it's but not, not Mac. not Mac, yeah, yeah. Michael Ray Richards. No, no. This guy was a shooting guard. This guy was a two-time All-Star. John Drew. He won the All-Star game. No, good guess. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this guy was called the Iron Man. No. Oh. <laughs> Tony Stark? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. AC Green. <laughs> I'm just going to give Cal it to Ripken? you because it's tough. Randy. Randy Brewer? <laughs> Randy Smith. Randy Smith. <laughs> Randy Smith. He's the all-time leader for their franchise. Well, no offense to Randy Nobody Smith. Knows. I got Blake Griffin as best Clipper ever. That's mm. fair. He's the only reason anybody ever cared about the Clippers. Mm. Chris City. Paul would have never become a Clipper if it wasn't for Blake Griffin. Mm. He was actually going to be a Laker. Yeah, if it wasn't for Adam Silver, <laughs> he would have been a Laker. I mean, excuse me, David, David Stern. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, Blake really did 
put the Clippers on the map. Yeah. That first season when he was playing with uh, Baron Davis, catching lobs, playing with Eric Gordon as well. That was a fun team to watch. And you're like, whoa, somebody cool on the Clippers? <laughs> a number one pick that actually panned out? Even when he finally started getting hurt, he turned into a great basketball player. That's the impressive thing is that, like, Blake Griffin finished third in MVP voting 2014. This was after he was, like, highlight real dunks and everything. He was early to the game as, mm-hmm. like, a big guy who's bringing the ball up and making plays. Yeah, and then he had, like, that resurgence year in Detroit where all he was NBA. all NBA and an all-star and put up monster numbers. He got them to the postseason, right? I don't think they won a game. Did he get injured, maybe? Yeah. Uh, down the stretch? Yes, yeah, he yeah. did, yeah. Yeah, so Blake Griffin officially retiring in style there with the funny little... Love letter to basketball on Twitter. Uh, We'll call it there. Action packed show. Thanks everybody for joining us live. We'll be back tomorrow to break down tonight's games. One of them will be on playback for. We'll start with the first one. We got Heat Sixers starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. Now it's on ESPN, so we know that's a lie. It's going to be 718, 720. But look, we'll be jumping on playback. That link is in the show notes. We had a blast last night. Come hang out with us. We usually stream this to YouTube as well, so we'll try and do that again tonight. But that's Heat Sixers on playback. And then we've got Trey Kirby's Chicago Bulls hosting the Atlanta Hawks in the second game tonight. So we'll recap those, and then tomorrow we'll do, just like we did today, our previews and predictions for the three Eastern Conference series that we will know by the end of the night. Pumped. Absolutely. You ready? Absolutely locked into every night. Whether it's the playoffs or the postseason. <laughs> See, I think piece. this is the postseason. And really? I think we then have the playoffs when we have our 16 teams. That's how I've always looked at it. I'm with you. It's yeah. like mergatory on Survivor. Yeah. yeah. Kind of, oh, jeez. Kind of sur- like your We merged. got Survivor tonight, too. I think it's going to be a... Real playoff start in Survivor. I think they're actually all together. <laughs> tonight, <laughs> we're tonight. sending only one tribe to tri- Tribal Council, it seems like. Big night. Big yeah. night on the tube. Who's uh, winning tonight? Who's winning these matches? Um... I'm going Sixers, and I am going your Chicago Bulls. Yeah, I can't believe it. You called it exactly right. Yeah, I, I, I would call the same. Okay. You're smart, okay. too. I hope I'm Good wrong. Ball. All right, we're going to find out. Uh, until then, Clipper Bros. You heard it here first. Have a great time. Turn up. Love you guys. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And remember, yes, I know ball, and I also know Randy's now. Because I didn't know Randy's before. I didn't know about Randy Smith. <laughs> but I will say, I know ball so well that Randy Smith is the best Randy in the history of the NBA. Better than Randy Foy. Better than Randy Foy. <laughs> Better than Randy Brown. Ooh. Wow. Yep. <laughs> Any other Randys? Not good ones. <laughs> got to be some Randys in the 80s. Yeah, <laughs> Denton, the Brewer, Mahaffey, Whitman. You don't hear Randy a lot uh-huh. anymore, do you? That's sort of a lost name. All right, brace the yep. people. <laughs>